Welcome to Praise, Prayer and Preaching with the Rev. Dr. Rick Dacey, Senior Minister, Wesley Congregational Life. I, um, I've never been a big fan of bumper stickers. But I do come from the land of bumper stickers, America. If you've ever been there, you know. I, I'm not sure why it is that, that Americans are so fond of bumper stickers. It may be that we're such an outgoing people, culturally, that we just can't bear the isolation of being in our cars without telling people our opinions on things. And bumper stickers g- give Americans an opportunity to tell everyone everything we're thinking all the time. If you, uh, if you spend some time driving in America, there's a fair chance that there's a bumper sticker that, uh, that you'll see, a bumper sticker that looks a little like this. <laughs> Jesus is coming. Look busy. It's a joke, of course. It's a joke, but, but the joke is based on a very real promise. Jesus made it clear again and again throughout his teaching and his ministry that he would die, that he would be raised from death, and that he would come again. And we remember this every time we come to this table, the table of the Lord. We remember Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. The Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthians, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Of course, all that stuff won't fit on a bumper sticker. The the promise gets boiled down to Jesus is coming. But the joke isn't in the promise. The joke is in our very human reaction to the promise. Look busy. Hmm? It's a reaction of a bunch of slacking workers afraid of getting chewed out by their taskmaster boss. Or, or the reaction of misbehaving class, a misbehaving class of school children whose teacher has been out of the room and now they, they see the teacher coming and they're all rushing back to their desks and opening their books. The joke works because we Christians know that we all fall short of Christ's call upon our lives. We know that. We know that there are times for all of us when our commitment to following Jesus gets crowded out by other priorities, by other calls on our time and our energy. And we know that there are times for all of us when, you know, if Jesus were to come back at a given moment... We'd want to stop what we're doing and and try to look busy being faithful disciples. The joke works because we know ourselves. But the joke also works because a lot of people don't really know Jesus. Hmm? In fact, the, the joke hinges on a fundamental misunderstanding of Jesus and his promise. Do you see Jesus as a strict teacher or a gotcha boss? Someone that's threatening to come back and catch us slacking off, slacking off or, 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 or stuffing up? Because if you do, then you might have found this evening's Bible reading from Luke 12 to be a little unsettling, maybe even threatening. Jesus tells a parable about, about the servants being ready for, a master, for their master's return, and, and he concludes the parable by saying, you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. If that sounds like a threat... That Jesus is going to catch us out. Consider this. He knows. Whatever it is, he knows. 
There's nothing can be hidden from God. God knows us, our every action, our every thought, our, our every conversation, our every motivation. And when Jesus returns, he's not going to be caught by surprise. He's not going to be shocked at us. He knows. He's not going to catch us out. He's not interested in catching us out. He knows us inside out, and he loves us fully. But even more important, to uh, listen to the word of God. Hear how Jesus frames the parable at the beginning of this passage. Do not be afraid, little flock. For your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom, to give you the kingdom. Another translation puts it, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. This is how he frames this parable. This is what delights God's heart. Not to catch you stuffing up or slacking off, but to give you the kingdom. It's easy for us to gloss over Jesus' words here and to miss the point of the parable if we have this preconceived notion of Jesus as the taskmaster, as the strict disciplinarian. And this is why the Lord wants us to be ready not to catch us, but to give to us. Not as a, as a task of of works righteousness. The the Lord calls us to receive a gift, the most extraordinary gift. Do not be afraid, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And that's, that's our call. Our call is to be disciples who make disciples. That's what it means to receive the gift of the kingdom. Jesus says... Be dressed. Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. Hmm? Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. You know, being ready is hard. What Jesus is talking about is hard. It's more than just saying yeah, yeah, I'm ready. It's a, it's a whole of life readiness. It's, it's, a, it's a whole focus and orientation. It's like a, like a fielder in the slips. Hmm? That focus, that attention, that readiness of the whole self. That's what it means to be ready. And it's hard. It's hard because there are so many calls upon our attention. There are so many calls upon our lives besides the call of Jesus. It's hard. The gift that Jesus has for us can come right by us, and we miss it because our, our mind is focused in a million different places. But when our, our whole self is focused on receiving, we're ready. We're ready. We're dressed and ready with our lamps burning. Now, being ready for the gift of the kingdom, of course, is much more. It's much deeper, and it involves our whole lives. And it it really has three key dimensions to it. First, it means being ready in real relationship with God. Getting real with God. Opening the door of our soul. Now again, God knows us inside out. When we open the door to our soul, we're not revealing anything to God. But we might reveal something to ourselves. And we might open ourselves up. When we do open ourselves up in real relationship, we find find that we are changed by that relationship with God. The more honest we can be with God, the more honest we can be with ourselves. And, and we, we begin growing. Growing a whole-of-life relationship. It's not a, a... Relationship isn't a task that you can tick off. 
It's, it's not, not something on your list, but relationship with God, tick. It's a journey of giving and receiving in, in our relationship with God. God takes the initiative. God takes the initiative. It is God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. And it's not for us to buy. The kingdom is not for us to earn. It's for us to receive as a gift. And that is, that's about journeying together in relationship with God, led by the Spirit, walking in the way of Jesus Christ. It's not about ju just saying the sinner's prayer once and done. No, it's a lifelong journey. Jesus tells us, Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourself that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail. Where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The journey he's leading us on is long. And the going can get really tough. Jesus wants us to be dressed and ready. Dressed and ready. And that means making sure that we have everything we need and making sure that we don't have all the things that we don't need. I have a friend, uh, his name is Harry. And Harry, in his early 20s, decided to do something really uh, adventuresome. He decided that he was going to set out and hike the entire length of the Appalachian Trail. The Appalachian Trail is a track in America that extends for 3,500 kilometers. The length of the Appalachian mountain chain, it, it, it follows that whole length from Georgia all the way up to Maine. It's a long way. Imagine walking from here to Perth. If the way from here to Perth had a mountain range all along it. Imagine that walk and you'll get an idea of what Harry was setting out to do. He set aside six and a half months for his hike. Which is about how much time it takes most of the people who are able to accomplish it. And, and, uh, and as he went, as he, as he prepared to go, he hit all the camping stores. He, he wanted to make sure that he had everything he was going to need. And he, he got the very best kit, the very best equipment, and he got, he got everything for every conceivable condition and every conceivable situation. I mean, you have to understand, in these six and a half months, he could pre be prepared, he needed to be prepared to hike through freezing cold temperatures and, and waist-high snow. And he needs need to be prepared for hiking in blazing hot summer sun with stifling humidity and for days of walking through, through mud and rain. He needs to be prepared for it all. And he knew, he knew that once he got out on the trail, he needed to be entirely self-sufficient. So Harry, when he set off on the trail in, in March, his pack was full with everything that he would need, everything he could possibly need for his journey. A few weeks in, he came to realize that his pack felt a whole lot lighter in the camping shops than it did when he was out on, on the trail and he was... He was walking over mountains and covering 30, 40 kilometers a day. And it wasn't long before he started to let go of some of those things. In fact, he found himself happily giving away things that, that he thought just a few weeks earlier his life depended on. That he literally could not live without, and yet he found himself joyfully giving them away, because they were weighing him down, they were hurting him, they were holding him back, and he was falling further behind on, on his goal. And he found himself giving these things away with joy. 
By the time he reached the other end of the Appalachian Trail, Harry's pack was about two-thirds lighter than when he started. He learned a lot in his half a year out on the trail, but the most important lesson that he learned is that no one walks the trail from beginning to end. No one who who walks that trail from, from beginning to end journeys alone. There were people who were self-sufficient, but the self-sufficient ones were the dabblers, the day hikers, who would go out for a day, or, or the weekenders. But the serious hikers, the through hikers, as they're called, the ones who were going from Georgia to Maine or the other way around, they knew that they needed to rely on each other. They didn't walk alone. No one carries everything they need in their own pack. They rely on each other and often on complete strangers. Every hiker has stories of strangers who were there for them and generously gave them what they needed when they needed it. They're called, they, they call them, the hikers call them trail angels. And this is what Jesus is saying here in Luke. Your journey of discipleship isn't about your self-sufficiency. It's about your faith and your trust in my sufficiency for you, says Jesus. Let go of the things that are weighing you down. Give them away. Trust me. Jesus is unfolding his promise here. He's not trying to take things away from us. He's not setting up obstacles for our discipleship or hoops of righteousness for us to jump through. He just wants us to be ready for the journey from now until we reach our destination. It is God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And Jesus wants us to be ready to receive it. Which leads us to the second dimension of readiness to receive the gift of the kingdom. Becoming ready in authentic community. Jesus' teaching here in Luke, and indeed throughout the Gospels, is directed not towards isolated individuals, but towards a community of faith. He's, He's talking to a community of disciples and followers... And that's really important because the way of Jesus is not a home study course. It's a journey of faith lived out in the community of faith. Jesus makes it clear from the beginning. What does he do? He calls a community around him. And what a community. He first calls the fishermen, of course. And I'm thinking the fishermen might have You could excuse them for thinking that, oh, Jesus is going to call people like us. People who look like us and have our life experience, think like us, talk like us. We're going to be the little band. Until Jesus goes and he calls a tax collector. A traitorous tax collector who has been squeezing hard-working people like the fishermen and enriching himself using his power. And now Jesus <laughs> Jesus is saying to them, no, this is not going to be a, a, a holy fisherman's club. The tax collector is going to be part of our band too. I can just imagine the awkward silence as this sinks in for the fishermen. Now, this is a different kind of community. And community is hard. Community is hard. It would have been hard for those fishermen. It's hard for us. Those of you who have been part of the church for a while, part of this church, part of other churches, you know community, real, authentic community is hard. Because we all bring our brokenness into community. We all bring our humanity into community. God has a purpose for that. Community is hard, and we need to be ready for that, trusting that the Lord will give us the grace we need for the journey. You know, one of my, 
One of my spiritual heroes is A.J. Gordon. Gordon was a Baptist minister who worked among the poor in Boston in the late 19th century. He, he had this, this really beautiful saying. He said, we can do more than pray. Hmm? We can do more than pray. Do you believe that? He said, we can do more than pray after we've prayed. But we cannot do more than pray until we have prayed. I think that's, that's really powerful because uh, how many times you hear, oh, you can do more than pray. Uh, we can do more than pray after we've prayed. But we cannot do more than pray until we have prayed. Uh, you probably have never heard of A.J. Gordon. It's, uh, it, I, I, anybody else have A.J. Gordon as a spiritual hero? No, no, I didn't think so. You probably never, you might have heard of, uh, you might have heard of some of his hymns. He composed an, a number of hymns, uh, including My Jesus, I Love Thee. Uh, so that you, you, but most of you wouldn't have heard of him. But he was very well known in his day. In fact, he was a controversial figure in his day in Boston. He was, he was somebody who, who stirred up a lot of controversy. He caught a lot of flack from the Baptist church establishment, and, and he was sharply criticized in the religious press because he served among the poor. That in itself did not stir up controversy. Yeah, it's wonderful. He served among the poor. Yeah. The trouble was the kind of poor that Gordon served among. He served among the people down by the docks in Boston. Hmm. The kind of people who were known among good, respectable religious folk as the wrong kind of people. People whose miserable lives were regarded as, as being bound up with their own moral failings. They got themselves into it. Let them get themselves out of it. But Gordon worked among these people, and he, he responded to his critics saying, let the scientific charities look after the worthy poor. My mission is to the unworthy. He founded the Boston Missionary Training Institute in 1889, and that stirred up even more controversy. It stirred up even more controversy because unlike other theological schools at the time, Gordon included men and women in preparation for ministry and mission. And from the beginning, the student body included both whites and people of color. And that was a really big deal in America in the late 19th century. A really big deal. Again, his critics railed against him, but Gordon brushed them aside. His view was essentially this. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. We don't know the hour, but he is coming, and we need to be ready. We don't have time to waste with our, our petty prejudices. God has called workers to the harvest, and with, when Jesus comes, I don't want to be the one who has to explain to him why I turned away people whom he had called. Which brings us to the third dimension of readiness. Being ready to receive the gift of God's kingdom is being ready to serve. In Jesus' parable, he talks about the master who returns to find the servants dressed and ready to serve. Their lamps are lit, their eyes are open, and when the master knocks, they are ready to open the door to him. And this isn't a last-minute reaction. Jesus is coming, look busy. And they've been waiting for this moment. And these servants, they've been getting ready for this moment, for a long time. But, but there, there is one startling surprise in this parable. Did you hear it? 
There's one startling surprise. The master, the master, what does he do when the, the servants open the door to him? Jesus says he'll get on his work clothes and he'll serve the servants. He comes home, and what is his first thing he's going to do is he's going to put on his work clothes and serve the servants. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve. We'll have them recline at table, and we'll come and wait on them. And here we see why the servants are ready to serve. It's not that they're fearful of their master's punishment. And and they're not looking for, for a nice pat on the back. No, these servants are simply a reflection of their master. It is his good pleasure to to put on work clothes and serve them. Their servanthood is a direct reflection of the character and the heart of their master. It is their delight to serve. Hmm? It is their delight to serve because it is his delight to serve. And we see the three dimensions of readiness that are right here. The servants are in genuine relationship with their master. They know their master's heart. And together in community, they are ready to reflect the master in their servanthood. Sisters and brothers, Jesus is coming. That's not a threat. It's a promise. We don't need to rush around looking busy. We just need to reflect the heart of the master. We just need to open the door and reflect the image of our creator. Do not be afraid, little flock. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, little flock. For it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Let's get ready to receive it.